The second phase, really, there is no controversy. We have a lot of evidence. And that is the time since Columbus came to the New World and all those other mariners from the Old World coming here. And this, of course, will be the period that corresponds from 1492 right through the period of slavery. We have a lot of evidence of Muslims coming to this part of the world. I mean, in Columbus' own expedition, you had Muslims. Estevanico and all those people, so they came, there were some Jews and some Muslims who were on board with Columbus. That one we do know, with the evidence is there, we don't have any doubt about that. Now, the, 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 even though the expedition was coming from a triumphant Catholic Spain, because at that time, Ferdinand and Isabel were able to establish hegemony over the Iberian Peninsula. The last stronghold of Muslim Spain fell, Grenada. But the Muslims were losing since the 11th century, really, in the Andalusian Peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula. 1492 is really celebrated uh, uh, as the great uh, period, and it coincided with the expedition of Columbus. But 1492 really is the culmination of a series of reversals that started since the 11th century in that region. So during this second phase, Muslims came to the New World in two ways. You had Muslims who found themselves living in the Iberian Peninsula under very difficult conditions because they were now faced with the choice of either emigrating out of uh, uh, the Iberian Peninsula to North Africa or taking their chances and coming to the New World. There were a lot of Muslims who did that, there were a lot of Mus and Jews who did that, they came to the New World. And of course, the history of the Southwest and the history of southern part of what is now called the United States, which was Hispanic territory, Florida and others, we have evidence of Muslim presence in these areas. Now, where the evidence is more available is of course during the time of slavery when you had at least 10% of the slaves who came out of Africa were Muslims. And people like Alan Austin, Sylvain Juf, Roger Bastide, if you go to South America, Gilberto Frey, uh, and Ignatius Etienne, and many other scholars, you know, from the Portuguese, from the Spanish, from the English, from the French. Uh, you read uh, Sylvain Juf's book, which is called Servants of Allah, Enslaved Africans in the New World. I mean, and you read Alan Austin's book, African Muslims in Antebellum America, you will have a rich collection of information about Muslims who were here from the time of Columbus right up to the time when the Civil War erupted in the United States. So we have a lot of data and new, many numerous books have uh, been uh, written by scholars we have, I can just give you profile briefly, and in passing, because we don't have the time, of some of the major Muslim slaves who are known to American historians and scholars who are now writing about the Muslim experience in America. We have the most celebrated slave, uh, Muslim slave, was Ayyub ibn Suleiman Jallo, who was a prince from Bondu. But he was himself involved in the slave trade. You know, there's a, there's a twist, ironic twist here. And he landed as a slave himself in the Americas. Yes, please. Could you write that name? Those names on the please. Oh, OK. <laughs> you have uh, the, he's known as Job, as in the Bible, Job ben Solomon. That's how he's known. But his Muslim name really is Ayub, Ayuba ibn Suleiman. Well, some people will spell Suleiman differently, but M-A-N. Jallo, this is his last name, Jallo. This is the French spelling. The English would say J-A-L-L-O-W. But the French spelling, J so if you go to the uh, Senegal and Mali and Guinea, they have been influenced by the French, so they'll spell Jallo as D-I-A-L-L-O. Now, he was a prince. There's a whole book about him that was written by someone who knew him, uh, Douglas Grant. You know, and Blewett, Thomas Blewett was the first one to write the book, but there's an other book, uh, it's called The Fortunate Slave. It's about this fellow, this prince who ended up as a slave in America, and his story was known, and he was liberated by one of the 
members of the British Admiral. And of course, he, he got his freedom from Annapolis, Maryland, where he was a slave, and ended up in uh, England, where he met royalty. Uh, there's a book called Blacks in Britain. If you look at that book, you will see the story of Ayub Ibn Suleiman Jalo narrated there. And then from there, of course, he went back to the Senegambia region where he came from, and he was very helpful to the British Africa Company in their trade connections with the African hinterland. So that was the, his story. There's another celebrated story who is now becoming legendary in terms of Muslim studies in America. And that is Yaro Mahmoud. Now his name was anglicized to Yaro Mahmoud. But really, uh, his name in the region in Africa where he came from, he'll be known as Yoro. The name Yaro is also there, but it's most probably his name was Yoro Mahmoud, because that will make him a Fulani, Yoro Mahmoud. Now, what is very interesting about this fellow, Yoro Mahmoud, is the fact that Yoro Mahmoud would be known in the American book, Guinness Books of Records, as the oldest American ever to live in this country. Because he lived, according to Peel, the well-known uh, American artist, uh, Vincent Peel, I mean, uh, he was 134 years old. And Peel, of course, immortalized Yoro Mahmoud through the portrait he made of him. There were two portraits, one made by Peel, another one made by another artist who was a contemporary. And of course, what is remarkable about this fellow was that even though he was in captivity, he still maintained his Islam. And uh, he was engaged in zikr, which is praise singing, you're praising God's name. And he owned property in Georgetown. There's a whole story about that. And if you go to the Smithsonian, there's a book there called Blacks in Pre-Revolutionary America produced by the Smithsonian Institution. And there's a chapter in that book called Maryland Muslim. It's about this fellow. Now, I was able to secure from the state archives in Maryland the papers of manumission, that this fellow was owned by the Beal family, a prominent family in the Silver Spring area. And the Beal family manumitted him. And of course, his story now, if you look at two new books that came out, one by Alan Austin, the other one by Turner, Brian Turner. The cover of these books all carry Yoro Mahmoud's picture or photo, you know, the portrait of him. Now, uh, besides Yoro Mahmoud, we had another colorful fellow by the name of Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman was another prince who ended up as a slave in America. And there's a book by Terry Alford Terry Alford's book on this Abdurrahman is known as Prince Among Slaves. And Abdurrahman, Rahman was a prince, and of course he was captured in battle, and he ended up in America as a slave in Natchez, Mississippi. Now what is interesting about him was the fact that because he was literate in Arabic, he was discovered by a medical doctor, Dr. Cox, who had been shipwrecked in Africa and was saved, interestingly enough, by the father of this guy. And, and this, he was a young man, and he was discovered after almost 40 years of captivity by this Dr. Cox. And Dr. Cox remembered him as the young man who was with his father, and that his father saved him when he was shipwrecked in Africa. Now, Dr. Cox was able to smuggle a letter through the American Colonization Society. And that letter ended up in the hands of the Sultan of Morocco. And it was the Sultan of Morocco who wrote to the American president at the time, Monroe. And Monroe instructed his Secretary of State Clay to intervene. And of course, they intervened. And Thomas Foster, who was the slave master, obliged. 
on the condition that the man would have to leave, but he cannot take his children with him. Yes? Was there, I heard that there was a, uh, a treaty, and I just want to substantiate this with you, there was a treaty that the Moroccans had made with the Americans about Muslim slaves, that they would be uh, returned. Well, the Moroccans, were, yeah, the Moroccans there, there was an agreement. In Virginia, there was the understanding that Muslim, I mean, slaves from Morocco would be liberated because Morocco was the first one to accept the United States. So if you were a slave from Morocco, if, they, if, they, if, if you are a Moroccan and you happen to end up in captivity, you would be freed. But that was... That applied to Moroccan. They were a very small number of people. Now, this Abdurrahman was the beneficiary of the Sultan of Morocco's intervention. Was and of, he Moroccan? Well, no, he was not Moroccan. But see, what, what was very interesting, you have some of those Africans who came from the Fulani groups, you see, who were invariably uh, uh, not seen as African because they were Muslim, they were literate, and all the other things that goes with it. So that was that perception that developed at that time. But the liter Terry Alford, if you, read, if you really want to know more about him, you should get a copy of Terry Alford's book, Prince Among Slaves. He's another very colorful fellow. But you have people like Saleh Bilali, who was a slave in South Carolina. You have the Sapilo Islands of the Georgia coast and of the Carolina coast. Now what was interesting about him was he was one of those slaves who was appointed to be an overseer. And he was able to keep records using Arabic, to keep records in, on the plantation. And of course, uh, Saleh Bilali's great-grandchildren remembered him when the FDR established the FPA, WPA, the work project that was started by FDR. So most of those Americans who at that time were writers or journalists who didn't have employment, they went around the country recording a lot of things. So one of the t stories that they recorded was about the descendants of Saleh Bilali, who reported about their grandparents and great-grandparents and some of the residues of Islam, because they buried their dead facing the east, and the kids reported some accounts. This we now have in the records, so if someone is particularly interested in that. Now, there are many other stories, and if you're really interested in these stories, you can read Alan Austin's book, which is over 700 pages. He was able to do a great deal for scholarship by collecting all these literary fragments about slaves, Muslim slaves. And his book is known as African Muslims in Antebellum America. He has two versions. You have the source book, we collect all the sources, and then he also has a paper bag, which is a smaller one, giving the narratives about each of these slaves. Now, of course, before him, you have people like Philip Corton, uh, who was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for many years. Now he's at John Hopkins in Baltimore. Philip Corton uh, edited a volume called Africa Remembered. And it has the narrative of slaves, not only Muslims. There were some Muslims, but many of them were not Muslims. Uh, Equino and all those other slaves' narratives in that book. So you have a body of literature about the slave experience. I think we have a lot of information. School teachers can now go to the library. They have a lot of information about this period. The scholars have generated a lot of material. So one could really have lesson plans and you can talk about Muslim slaves in America. And it's becoming, moving from the footnotes to the text. That's one thing that scholarship is about, you see. When we have limited data, you end up as a footnote. As we get more data, you end up in the text. You see, so that's what's happening. And of course, school teachers play a very important role in that. That's in terms of moving you from the footnote to the text. 